Good morning. So I looked and felt a lot cuter when I recorded this last night, but uh, something went wrong. So here we go again um, with the third lecture um, today, which is going to deal with kind of a continuation of the themes from uh, last week's lecture on observation and objectivity in science. Um, so let's just do a little um, tidy summation of, of what we've talked about uh, so far. So I didn't have you um, make these maps in class, but um, normally that is a, something that we do. We didn't really have time, or I, I couldn't really figure out how to fit that, fit that in, but uh, we talked about science and what science is and what it means to do science and how we sort of like think about science as a as a as an entity as an institution. Um, so what counts as science? We went through that slideshow, right? Is it a methodology? Is it a cultural practice? Is it empirical methods or logic? Um, is it defined by its materials or its institutions or its target of study, right? So there are lots of ways to think about what science actually is and what it means to be a scientist conducting science in 2020. Um, and historically as well. And we also need to distinguish the differences between knowledge, scientific knowledge, scientific practice, and scientific application, because those are all different, right? Maybe the difference between, um, you know, someone like myself who is producing sort of basic scientific knowledge versus um, an architect who's applying science to kind of create a structure. We also talked about um, nature as being perhaps the subject of science. So what is nature? Is it living things, non-living things? Is it everything? Is it nothing? Is it social? Is it behavioral? Is it related to math? Is it a human construct? Is it with or without humans? What are the roles that humans play in defining nature and then existing within or adjacent to nature? And so we had a slideshow on that as well. Um, there's really no way, we talked about, to define this word without complicated questions about how humans relate to na nature, and of course ethics are immediately involved anytime uh, we think about the role of humans in both existing within and defining nature. All right, last week we started this sort of broad, um, conceptual, topical look at what is science? And we started with observation. We observe things. Um, and we used color as a proxy to emphasize that there's no such thing as direct perception, right? We see things with our eyes, um, but we never quite see exactly what it is. So all knowledge is mediated by instruments, whether those instruments are our eyeballs or our ears or a satellite. Um, instruments mediate information as it's coming from the source to our brains where we then interpret it, right? This introduces questions of objectivity and subjectivity. Humans are always conducting science. It doesn't happen in a vacuum. And so we need to think about the ways in which humans are interpreting the data that they're receiving, whether it be through their eyeballs um, or through an instrument, right? And then we have to think about how to represent those data quantitatively, graphically, representing non-sensory knowledge in a way that we can understand what we're seeing. That's usually through graphs or maps or pictures, that sort of thing. So we're going to continue this theme today by talking about the age of the Earth. Okay, We're going to use this to kind of expand on our understanding of objectivity and subjectivity and the conduct of science and how we do science. And we're going to use it specifically to illustrate human versus non-human scales in space and time. The influence, uh, inference of, um, of data and conclusions beyond direct observation, right? So we can have, um, we can directly observe things, but um, we can't directly observe everything, especially things that have happened far in the past or will happen in the distant future, and we'll get to that in a second. We'll also just briefly think and touch on ways um, and this might come next lecture, but more so, but ways that we introduce uncertainty and assumptions, especially assumptions in science. And so next week we're going to expand on this again and talk about science versus pseudoscience and what are the distinguishing features between the two because a lot of things um, sort of get passed off as science but actually are not what I would consider um, scientific inquiry or scientific exploration, although that's a great topic.
uh, for discussion. So before we get to the age of the Earth stuff, I just want to sort of talk about graphs and how we use graphs to represent complicated data in a way that we can understand, although some people still find graphs to be very complicated, so I want to kind of um, talk about that and touch on that. So how do we read them generally? How do we read graphs? And, and specifically, let's read this graph, okay, um, where we're representing um, non-sensory information using numbers and figures and charts and, and lines and that sort of thing. So with this graph in particular, what we're showing here on the left is the percentage of light that is absorbed by a cone in your eye, right? And this is uh, showing what the cones look like for dichromats or folks who we might call colorblind. Um, and on this axis, that's the wavelength of light. So we, we remember, hopefully, from last week that 400 wavelength um, light, very short wavelengths, is more um, blue colored, and 650 and above is more red colored, and then everything um, on the rainbow is, is in between. So you can see, for example, the S cone um, absorbs almost 100% of light that's coming in at about 420 wavelengths. That's what this stands for, 100%. But at about 520%, that goes, or 520 nanometers, that goes down to about 0%. Um, and then beyond that, the S cone can't even perceive or see that light. The L cone, in contrast, absorbs 100% of light that's at about 560 nanometer wavelengths. Okay? So that's what this chart means. So now let's show another chart with quote-unquote normal human vision or trichromatic where we have three cones. We have the S and the L and then the M cone in between which absorbs a hundred percent of light at about 550 nanometers. And you can see that this scale is actually different than this scale. This goes from zero to one. This goes from zero to a hundred. In this case one and a hundred are anal what we call analogous. Um, meaning this is shown as a percentage and this is shown as a proportion. So what is happening here is that folks with just S and L cones okay, are missing a lot of these stronger wavelengths in the middle which happens to be where most of the light from the sun um, uh, that's the wavelength that most of the light from the sun comes in at uh, about five between 5 and 550 right. So this M cone really helps um, trichromatic human beings see um, a wide range of colors and an, an example of this is these two photos where on the left we've got uh, what, it, what, what this scene of fruit might look like to someone with all three cones and then what it might look like to someone with just those two cones. Um, for folks who are watching this who may actually be dichromatic or colorblind these may look actually more similar than to folks who are trichromatic. Okay, so we're representing this contrast using graphs. So this is why graphs are so important for the communication especially of science, but also the conduct of science. I need to see graphs in order to understand what question I'm going to investigate next, for example. Satellites can do the same thing that the human eye can do, but even more so because we can design them to do whatever we want. We can design them to see whatever wavelength of light we want them to see. So here's an example of the MODIS and MISER satellites. There are two different satellites that um, observe reflected um, light that's coming into, into the eye uh, or into the sensor on the instrument and um, that's not really how the eye sees things, right? But it's similar in that the instrument is receiving these uh, wavelengths of light and then it, it, when we want to know what, we, what the instrument saw, we've got to represent it as a graph or sometimes a picture, right? And so we talked about how color um, in these satellite images is not the same as color in a photo or from our eyeballs, but we can think of it in a similar way in that the, the satellite instrument is receiving this wavelength information um, and then th this radiation information at various wavelengths and then we can take those data and interpret them and present them as a, as a photo. Um, this is another example of that except this is not even close to what this might look like if we saw it with our own eyes because these wavelengths probably um, these wavelengths of light 
are probably beyond the visible spectrum. So this is a, you know, taken from the Hubble telescope, um, looking out to space, looking at um, some sort of um, extra galaxy feature. And uh, this looks like sort of a cloud, a reddish cloud, but that's just because that's how humans have chosen to represent the data that the instrument is, is, is receiving um, in, a, in a sort of an aesthetic way. So there is absolutely art involved in communicating science, right, and representing science so that we know what we're looking at. Another example here, this is not what this actually looks like, um, but this is a way that we can represent it so we understand what's going on, which is which calls into uh, question all of these ideas of objectivity versus subjectivity and the role of aesthetics in communicating science. So now let's shift gears a little bit and talk about the age of the earth and see how that relates to this idea of observation and, and, and objectivity. So specifically, can we know what the age of the earth is? Is that something that we, we can do? And if so, how do we do it? So we're going to talk about that and some historical references to that. And then we're going to end with some um, scientific uh, comparisons between sort of the science of the age of the earth and what uh, Christian young earth creationists might say about the age of the earth, right? And, and we'll contrast the two, and that will be a nice lead-in to next week where we'll talk about science versus pseudoscience. So before we get to that, I'd like to do a little mini exercise on your own if you, if you um, can pull out a piece of paper and uh, ignore the part that says with the person sitting next to you, but just on your own, draw a little timeline of the universe from the beginning to now. So when the universe started to now. Um, and annotate the major events, like when did the Earth form, when did humans evolve, and when did the universe begin. But you can also add extra things like when the solar system formed, the galaxy, when the first life on Earth happened, that sort of thing. So just make a little uh, mini timeline. I want to see what folks... Um, think about this stuff, and then uh, make sure that you you um, direct message me your timeline um, before we, we meet for class, if you're able to watch this then, because I'm going to show a video on, on sort of the actual timeline of the universe. So I just want you to kind of conceptually think about this. Um, best guess, maybe some of you know more than others, and that's okay about this kind of stuff. I just, I'm very curious to see what folks think. All right, so let's talk about the age of the Earth. How do we know how old the Earth is? Well, first of all, we know the Earth is old because of things like this. We know that the Grand Canyon, for example, uh, was caused by a catastrophic flood, right? Wrong. <laughs> the Grand Canyon was caused by slow erosion. We know this now because of all of the stuff that we're going to talk about in the rest of this lecture. But at one time, um, it's possible that you assume that one could would assume that the Grand Canyon could have been caused by a catastrophic flood that just carved out a huge section of the Earth's surface and created this canyon. We now know that it was caused um, by slow erosion, and a lot of that is due to the work of Charles Lyell, who is one of the earliest geologists um, and wrote the book Principles of Geology, which was published in the 1830s. One note from Catherine here is that um, science teachers and textbooks always do this. They always showed the white guys, the old white guys, instead of all the other people. Some of that is a product of the fact that those other people were um, not allowed to participate in academic endeavors. Um, and some of it is just because uh, white guys um, as horrible and um, sort of destructive as they have been throughout history are the quote-unquote winners and so they get to write the textbooks. Um, so our knowledge is sometimes limited to that. But back to Charles Lyell. Um, Charles Lyell was thinking about things like the Grand Canyon and thinking about these layers of rock and he wrote about the principles of geology and he, he thought maybe we can tell the relative age of these different layers of rock by looking at where they are in proximity to each other, meaning rocks on the bottom are probably older than rocks on the top, right? So A is probably younger here, for example, than D, okay? And this is what Charles Lyell wrote about a lot in the 1830s as, as geology was starting to become a discipline. Um, and so we know that because of this, 
knowledge that Charles Lyell put forward, the Grand Canyon was not caused by a catastrophic flood, but it was caused by slow erosion, a process known as sedimentation, where older rock is at the bottom and newer rock, which is sedimenting on top of it, depositing on top of it and creating a sediment, um, is younger than the rock below it. Okay, and so on and so forth as we go um, as we go up in the rock layers. So this is really important because we understand, right, that the Earth is fairly old for this to have happened, probably. Um, for there to be older rock down here and younger rock on top of it. Even digging at Foster Beach, okay, um, uh, you can dig in the sand and you can actually see the sedimentation process happening almost at a human scale, right? So a rate that's observable um, in relation to, to quote-unquote human time. Humans live for, what, 80 to 100 years, right? And so um, we can't observe things happening over millions of years, but we can observe things happening over days, hours, uh, months, even years. Um, so these are what we call human scales. And so we can actually see the gradual geologic process, like layering of sedimentation, happening even at Foster Beach. So when you dig down here, you can see, right, for example, the layers of sand. Maybe it was really rainy and then um, some drier sand got blown in or something happened that sediment that, that caused the sedimentation um, to be a different color. Um, and this is exactly what happens um, to rocks, right, in, in, in the Grand Canyon, for example, the rocks that we can observe in the Grand Canyon, but they're happening at different time scales. But what's important to note is the process that's causing this sedimentation at Foster Beach is the same sedimentation process that's causing this, the, the layers to form at the Grand Canyon. And so this is a really important concept known as uniformitarianism, which says that changes in the Earth's crust during geological history have resulted from the action of continuous and uniform processes. So the same process that's forming sediment, uh, sediment layers at Foster Beach is the process that's forming uh, sediment layers, for example, in this scene or in the Grand Canyon. Um, and so because of this, we know, right, we can assume um, with great, great confidence, with ultimate confidence, in fact, that <clears throat> sedimentation um, is a process that what, what happens now is the same thing that was happening then. And so when we look at this rock, we know then, assuming uniformitarianism, assuming that sedimentation isn't increasing or decreasing um, at different rates, that these large planetary scale sedimentation processes are not, uh, were not super fast in the past and now they've slowed down, as young Earth creationists might argue, right? They'll argue that the Earth is 5,000 years old and that this sedimentation was happening at super fast rates and then now it's slowed down. That's not what we know to be true. We know that uniformitarianism, an assumption, dictates that sedimentation that was happening millions and millions of years ago is similar in process to the sedimentation that's happening now. And so we can then infer that this is a really old rock. So we know then that sedimentation over millions of years, right, per the theory of uniformitarianism, is what caused the Grand Canyon. There was sedimentation, then uplift, and then slow erosion. Slow, long, uniform processes that have been happening for all of Earth's history and can and allow us to infer that Earth is, for lack of a scientific term, very old. Okay, here's an example um, of another rock where we can observe um, long time scale sedimentation. It's difficult for our brains to grasp the scale because we live for 80 years. We don't live for 4 billion years. So it's difficult for us to sort of understand how this rock could have formed um, over such a long time scale. Volcanoes are a similar process, right? We know that over time, volcanoes erupt and they continue to create um, larger and larger islands. We know that the Hawaiian Islands, right, were formed by 
long time scale volcanic activity, millions and millions of years occurring through um, uh, the same processes that are occurring today that we can observe with our own eyes and instruments. And that's why we assume with great degree of confidence this theory of uniformitarianism. We even see this um, in this photo, right, which looks like a landslide uh -huh, on Mars. So even on other planets, we can assume that uniformitarianism holds. Um, and, and, and we can see, for example, the landslide itself, but also the sedimentation that occurred on Mars over millions and millions of years. Okay, same goes for when we observe uh, weather patterns. If the time scales are shorter, but we can assume that the same mechanisms that are creating these weather patterns have existed um, as long as there's been this constituent makeup of the atmosphere and on other planets as well, like Jupiter. I don't know why this photo is here. <laughs> so we can use this idea of uniformitarianism and the principles of geology um, text that Charles Lyell set forth in the 1830s to relative date rocks. Okay, Relative means we know their age in relation to each other. So for example, in this image, G, uh, rock G is younger than rock P. We know this to be true. Um, and rock P is younger than rock T, which is younger than rock A, which is younger than rock M. Because of sedimentation, we know that the oldest rocks are at the bottom, the youngest rocks are at the top. Things can happen that shift that, right, like an earthquake uh, or a volcanic eruption or a slow collision of, of tectonic plates, right, which possibly in this uh, image tilted it. So we do know that C, for example, is younger than G, but we also know that B is younger than C. G gets, well, maybe not G, but A here does also touch B, right, this layer here, but we know it's younger than C because of the sedimentation of these rocks. So we can relative date all of these rocks in relation with each other um, and, and so we know how old they are relative to each other. So here's an example that I'm going to have you do um, on your own as group work. So let me just pull this um, down here so you can pause the video here and I want you to uh, rank these layers, just putting the layer like A, B, C, D, whatever, from youngest to oldest. So which layer here do you think is the youngest? So just make a list, youngest to oldest, pause the video, youngest to oldest, and, and include that um, with the work that you did just prior to this um, on the, the universe timeline. Okay, so pause the video, good. All right, so we know a lot about relative dating, but what about absolute dating? What about the actual age in years, in human years, right, of the Earth? Well, that brings us to, to Lord Kelvin, um, where here, Catherine made another note. Catherine is the physicist, um, physics teacher, my, my colleague and contemporary, who helped design this course and specifically this portion of the course. Um, again, another really arrogant white male physicist. Um, so Lord Kelvin took on this question of what is the absolute age of the Earth. And he st started at this question by observing volcanoes. Volcanoes, we know, are erupting things, hot liquid magma, that's coming from deep inside of the Earth's core. So Lord Kelvin assumed correctly that the Earth's core was a hot uh, ball of, of magma that was ready to burst out to the surface. So the surface was cool, hard rock, and the surface of the, and the, and the center of the Earth um, was uh, very hot. And Kelvin argued that the Earth is simply not old enough for gradual uniformitarian change to account for all of its features. He ended up being wrong about this, and his, 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 his major assumption, right, when he calculated the age of the Earth, was that because the core of the Earth is a hot uh, ball of magma and the surface is cool, at one point in history, um, the whole Earth must have been the same hot 
temperature. The earth, the whole earth itself must have been a hot ball of magma and that gradually over time, Lord Kelvin said, it was cooling from the surface down. So it, it had started cooling up here, but hadn't quite reached the surface. And so then using that assumption, he calculated the age of the earth to be several hundred thousand years old based on the rate of cooling and the gradient between the, the, the center of the earth and the surface and the temperature difference and that sort of thing. He did all this math, he did all this science, and he decided that um, that the Earth was much uh, was about a couple hundred thousand years old, much younger than geologists like Charles Lyell were saying at the time. Although they hadn't really come to the to the conclusion of what it actually how how old it actually was, and so this brings us to the the idea of uniformitarianism in two different senses. So in in the geological sense, right, um, we say that uniformitarianism is the theory that all changes to the Earth involve gradual processes not sudden, extreme, or catastrophic ones, and that they are uniform now as they were then. The same processes now are the same processes then, and so then we can infer that the Earth is very old. We can expand this concept, and this is super important, so make sure that you really, really understand this, and if you don't, make sure you're writing down notes to ask me questions. In a general scientific sense, we can say that the idea of uniformitarianism posits that physical laws and processes that we can observe now, right, in a lab, with our eyes, with instruments in the present, we're operating the same in the past or where we can't see them, where we aren't directly observing them. And more broadly, this means that physical laws are the same everywhere and everyone. So, so something that we're observing now with our eyes, it doesn't change just because we can't see it. The same process occurs even when we are not seeing it, whether that be millions of years in the past or on another part of the planet that we're not currently observing directly. Okay, so I hope this makes sense to everyone. Uniformitarianism is so critical um, and integral to our understanding of science and scientific process. So Calvin ended up, of course, being wrong. We know that the Earth itself is actually 4.5 billion years old, not a couple hundred thousand years old. Um, but it's not because he did bad science. His science was actually okay. His math, his science, his calculations, that was all fine. He had a false premise. He had a false assumption, which was that the Earth is cooling uniformly from the outside in. That's not the case. It has never been the case. Um, or sorry, it was, it was cooling not uniformly from the outside in, but it was cooling from the outside in. Um, so this is a false premise. So if you start with a bad assumption, you're going to get a bad conclusion, no matter how good your science is in between those two. So he started with a bad assumption, and so he was never going to get the quote-unquote right answer, despite doing good science. And we call this idea of false premise good science. And the thing that Lord Kelvin did not know about was radioactive decay, which we now know... Uh, lots about and helps us to understand what the actual absolute age of the earth is. So let's talk briefly about um, about radioactive decay and radiometric dating. So when we talk about radioactive decay we're talking about the decay of radioactive atoms, elements. So here's the periodic table which um, if you're like me you shudder when you see this. I, chemistry just makes me um, but uh, these are the elements um, and you know, you can see them all listed, for example, silver, and then it's, it's um, atomic number, which is indicated, indicative, indicative of the number of protons and the number of neutrons, and or the number of neutrons in the nucleus of that atom. For example, in silver, right, it's 47, um, uh, carbon, it's 6, um, helium, it's 2, hydrogen, it's 1, okay? Um, uranium, down here, 92, for example. So when we talk about radioactive elements, what we're actually talking about are elements that have more neutrons than are, than are listed in the, in the periodic table. They're radioactive, which means that they are what we call unstable, which means that over time, uranium with too many neutrons in the, proton, in the nucleus are going to, is going to slowly decay so that it's more stable. It's more close to what it should be as listed in the periodic table. And so we can use this process of radioactive decay to radiometrically date rocks. 
So let's explain how this works. Let's say we start with 100 radioactive, oops, 100 radioactive uranium atoms, which we call ions. So we have 100 um, radioactive uranium ions. A billion years later, we have 50 radioactive uranium ions left, and the other 50 have become stable atoms. They've decayed to become stable atoms, and it took a billion years to go from 100 to 50, which means that half of the original radioactive material is now decayed to a stable material. So that billion years is what we call a half-life. It took that long for half of the material to decay to a stable state, which means that in two billion years, two half-lives will have gone by, which means that it'll be 50% less and then another 50% of the 50%, which means that it'll be 75% less than the original amount. And then three half-lives, four half-lives, eventually we're gonna get very close to none of that radioactive material left, right? And so this is what that looks like in a chart. So let's say we start here with 100% radioactive material. After one half-life, half of the radioactive material is left. After two half-lives, a quarter is left. After three half-lives, an eighth. After four half-lives, a sixteenth, and so forth. So on and so forth. So when we look at a, a, a rock, we can look at the ratio of radioactive material to stable material. And if that ratio is one out of two or one out of four, we can determine how many half-lives have transpired and how long that time has been. Okay, so we know, for example, that uranium-238 has a half-life of 4.5 billion years old, which means that if I have a rock um, that has radio radioactive uranium in it, 4.5 billion years ago, it had twice as much radioactive uranium. 4.5 billion years, it has decayed 50% or half a half-life. Uranium-235, though, a different radioactive version of uranium, has a much shorter half-life of just 713 million years. Thorium-232, though, has a half-life of 13.9 billion years, which is um, three times as long as uranium-238. And then plutonium-241 is somewhere in the middle with a half-life of 2.4 million years. Oh, sorry, very short um, half-life, somewhere at the shorter end of things, which is a 2.4 million year um, half-life. So we can use rocks with these different radioactive elements in them, looking at the ratio of radioactive to stable material and determine just how old those rocks are. Just to note, this is kind of a confusing graphic. I think it, it requires a human explanation, which is why I'm here explaining it to you. But visualization of science concepts can be hard, which is why I am very committed sort of sidebar as a scientist to exploring ways in which artists can help and or combine with scientists in the scientific endeavor um, to create not just better images but better science. So what we use uh, primarily to date the age of the earth are zircon crystals which contain radioactive uranium and through this uh, through this um, process we have been able to determine that the Earth is 4.55 billion years old. Okay, so we know that the Earth is very old, much older than, than young Earth creationists would say, what they would say about 5,000 years old, um, and much younger than um, Lord Kelvin even said because of his poor assumptions on, on what was going on um, geologically. He didn't accept uniformitarianism and therefore he came to the wrong conclusion despite good science. So we know the age of the earth is 4.5 billion years old. So why do young earth creationists, for example, continue to say that the earth is 5,000 years old? Well, this is an activity that we are going to do in class and we're going to watch a video um, which is linked here. So if you're not able to attend the Zoom, um, you can link to this video, which I'll also post the link in the Discord chat, um, to watch it because this is going to be your, your group work activity for the rest of today. Um, and so I'm going to leave, there's, there's, like th sorry, there's like three slides here, um, but I'm going to leave, uh, I'm going to leave, I'm going to end this here um, and introduce this uh, when we meet together synchronously so that 
um, I can explain it more clearly. Um, so that is the lecture. Make sure that you've um, written down all of your possible questions that you need to ask and that you're, you're really clear on this material if you need to go back and watch some of it for clarification or um, have questions, etc. Make sure that you've got that down and then we will meet and um, discuss all of this. All right. Sounds good. Let me just end this.